Vascularization and oxygenation are vital for wound healing. All patients with an ulcer below the knee need to have their vascular status examined. So we need to perform this test on Mary as her wound is on her ankle. Both her arterial and venous status must be assessed carefully and the first step is to do a Doppler examination to calculate the ankle brachial pressure index, the ABPI. This can be done by using an audible handheld Doppler or a Doppler ultrasound. For patients with a diabetic foot ulcer, the toe brachial pressure index will need to be assessed in a similar way. These results are a vital part of the assessment of a patient with lower limb ulceration and although not diagnostic in isolation, will help guide us towards the need for other investigations and the right treatment for Mary, such as compression. Compression therapy is not only the gold standard of treatment and prevention for patients with venous leg ulcers, but can also assist with the management of edema. If edema is present in Mary's leg, it will be important to investigate and treat the reason behind it as reducing edema will help promote wound healing. The result of Mary's ABPI must be known prior to an initial application of compression, as not only does it tell us she has adequate arterial supply to heal the wound, but also whether Mary will be able to have compression therapy as part of her treatment plan. The most important contraindication to compression therapy is advanced peripheral arterial disease, PAD, also called critical limb ischemia, CLI, both of which are detectable by knowing the ABPI. If Mary has superficial venous disease, she could make good progress and minimize the reoccurrence of her wound if she undergoes vascular interventions. This can be done with injections, laser, heat or surgery, for example. Patients with peripheral arterial disease will need to be investigated by a vascular specialist to understand if arterial intervention would be appropriate and beneficial. Sometimes pressure, friction or shear are the cause of insufficient blood circulation, so we will use different risk assessment tools to detect if Mary is at risk of developing pressure ulcers or injuries, or diabetic foot ulcers if she has diabetes. For patients who are at risk, offloading is key and can help prevent ulcers occurring in the first place. If they already suffer from these kind of wounds, offloading is even more important and essential for wounds to be able to progress and ultimately heal. The temperature of Mary's wound is another factor that can help affect healing and is connected to her vascular status. To promote a good healing environment, it is important not to cool the wound more than necessary, so we should only change her dressing when it is clinically indicated. By using the right dressing for the right wound and patient, we can avoid unnecessary dressing changes. During a dressing change, Mary's wound needs to be cleansed with body temperature solutions, such as sterile water, saline, or other solutions according to local guidelines and recommendations. Using solutions at body temperature prevent cooling of the wound and also prevent her blood vessels from constricting. Additionally, vital cells such as red and white blood cells operate better when they are at body temperature. It is important to inform and educate Mary about the positive impact exercise will have on her wound healing. We should aim to advise her on individual exercise programs that are right for her, so she can exercise safely and effectively. When a wound is present, the importance of eating a healthy diet is even more important and a dietitian may be needed to support Mary and give advice. Being either overweight or underweight can slow down wound healing, as can having a poor diet. Smoking also delays wound healing, so we need to encourage our patients to reduce or stop smoking so better blood flow can take place and oxygenation stimulate their wound to heal. Pain is another key aspect of wound management that can affect Mary's blood flow and therefore the vascularization of her wound as pain constricts blood vessels. This may compromise Mary's ability to exercise mainly because if you are in pain you don't want to exercise but also because it can reduce the amount of oxygen delivered to her muscles. Pain may also disturb her sleep and in some cases her appetite. 
To assess Mary's pain, we should measure it regularly with appropriate tools. All of these factors can have an impact on Mary's social life and in turn affect her mental health. And as both preventing and treating wound pain is such an important factor, we will talk more about how pain plays a part in wound healing in the next essential. It is claimed that hypoxia, a lack of oxygen, is present in most chronic wounds. This is not exclusive to arterial disease as first suspected, but also true of wounds caused by venous insufficiency. When used as an adjunct treatment, some oxygen therapy products can accelerate wound healing and improve healing rates as much as 90%. And not only do they add or transport oxygen to the wound bed to promote healing, but can also prevent and reduce wound-related pain. There are other local treatments that can stimulate vascularization and wound healing. For example, heat, vibration therapy, electrical stimulation, ultrasound and laser, but these treatments are not well studied scientifically and will only be carried out at specialist centers due to local guidelines. Now that we have explored how to implement our knowledge around wound vascularization and oxygenation into practice, we can move on to our next essential the need to prevent and treat wound pain and consider loss of sensation 